Hey, buddy. So before we get going, I kind of wanted to provide us with a, a brief uh, recap with where we've been over the last few weeks as we move out of Lent and now into Holy Week. Lent, of course, a time where we focus on our need for repentance as we look forward to the cross and look forward ultimately to the empty grave. We recognize why that was necessary. And that's what Lent has been all about for, uh, about, all about for us as we've been in this series called Mourn Again, where we've been trying to focus on our need for mourning, which is different than guilt, which is different than shame, but our need to mourn that we might repent. And Pastor Craig offered a great message about how we must first recognize our need for this. We must recognize uh, the brokenness within us in order that we can mourn it properly and move on from it. Pastor Mark shared a story about the death of Lazarus and how lament and mourning and also hope are all tied together within this gospel um, of Jesus. And last week, we shared a message from Philippians, the Apostle Paul, to talk about how our focus determines our future. And so we don't talk about repentance and we don't talk about sin and how we need to look back so that we can focus on it and feel bad, but instead... Mourning allows us to see what God can do with it and what God has done with it. And that can become our focus because Jesus has redefined our future. And today is Palm Sunday where we're going to take a look at how we can honor God. How we can once again be in awe of who God is and understand that that's how we are changed. But to start it, I want to play a game. And I'm going to show you some, some pictures of places that I've been around the world, and I want to see if you all can take it. Some of them are going to be easy, and some are going to be hard, okay? So bear with me. Um, <clears throat> see if anybody can guess. There's a couple of them that if you know it, I'm astounded. Uh, but we'll see. Where's that? Does anybody want to take a guess where that is? That is in uh, Poaz Volcano National Park in Costa Rica. So that's an active volcano that I was standing on the top of. Um, and took a hike up. That was really cool. What about that one? That is, that is the Sea of Galilee. That's the Sea of Galilee in Israel. Um, I've been there about three times. Where's that? That's Disney World. That's in Orlando, Florida at Disney World. Not Disneyland. That's Disney World in Orlando, Florida. I'm proud, I'm proud that I was there for this one. So I heard Ireland, you're close. That's Loch Ness in Scotland. Um, a rainbow happened. It was raining while we were there. It was kind of a pretty crazy moment uh, while we were there, but yeah, pretty cool. So that's Loch Ness in Scotland. That is in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Oahu in Hawaii, that one. And I've got two for this next one because it's just, it's just really cool. You're, okay, you're close. Uh, that's, we went dog sledding in Banff National Park in Canada. Um, and that's, that's Lake Louise right there, um, is what that one is. So um, there's that. All right, next one. This one's impossible. There's no way anybody's going to know this one, apart from people that were, like, there with us when we were there. That, that the ocean, that's actually not the ocean. That's the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, that is in Cyprus, which is an island, a Greek island, uh, that we hear about in our scriptures that the Apostle Paul would have been involved in uh, there as well. All right, maybe a couple more that are a little bit more familiar here. We're getting closer to home with these last ones. Anybody know? That is, I heard it that. That's the Devil's Icebox in Colombia. A uh, pretty, really cool place. If you haven't been there, I encourage you to do that. It's, it's pretty fun. About a 30-minute drive away. Where's that one? That's Bush, yeah, that's Bush Stadium. Well, I've, I've been to Kaufman. I don't need to take pictures. Um, that's Bush Stadium, and where's that one? That's, that's Arrowhead. Yep, that's on the field at Arrowhead. So these are just some of my favorite places that I've been. But I think, and you've probably, I'm sure, traveled different places in your life, and the reality is we take pictures when we go to special places, and the pictures are great, but it's not like being there, right? We take pictures so that we can try to elicit the response that we got emotionally and physically and neurologically and biologically when we were at these places that we love so much, whether they're man-made structures or geographical places. Pictures are great, but there's nothing like being there. And I think that there are some that are even worse than others. One of my favorites that people do, and if you've done this, I apologize, I'm not trying to make fun of you, 
But on 4th of July, inevitably, everybody's posting the pictures of the fireworks in the sky that they're like zooming in on their phone and it's grainy and whatever. It's like we all saw the same thing. Um, it's fine. It just doesn't do it justice. You have to be there to, uh, to experience the fireworks. Sunsets and sunrises are another one. Pictures are wonderful. But we all know it feels different when you're looking at it than when you take the best picture of a sunset or a sunrise. There's nothing like being there. And when we take pictures, we often can look, a point I want to make about all this is that we can look at pictures. We all love looking at pictures. We do, at my house, we have them all over the place and screensavers everywhere that are put, put in pictures about places we've been and things that we've done and honestly, sometimes just everyday life. But we love looking at pictures. But there's a difference between looking at the picture and actually beholding what's in the picture. To behold something and to look at it are two very different things. I think we can feel that. When we behold something, we have this emotional response when we get to behold some of the things that we get to behold, as opposed to when we just look at the picture and we reference something. When we behold something, we feel its impact. When we behold something, we feel its impact. And yet I think in our lives and in this world too much, we're drawn simply to look at a lot of things and we don't behold very many. Because we all seek after moments like this that I showed in some of the pictures, the moments where somehow we, we feel empowered and things feel right when we feel incredibly small. We seek out these moments and these places that it makes no sense that we would walk up to just a geographical location and have an emotive response to it. It's just a place. And yet we all seek these moments and we take pictures because we want to capture them. Because we recognize that those moments are fleeting. And they're hard to come by. And so we want to bottle them up. But we can't bottle them up. We can't always encounter them afresh and anew time and time and time again. But we seek after this feeling where we behold something, where we experience something, where we feel small because we feel the power of what's around us. And today, as a day where we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey, we wave palm branches, we remember the story as they shout Hosanna and welcome him. Today is a day to behold Jesus. Not to look at Jesus, not to look at our scripture, to behold Jesus. To behold Jesus in all of his power and beauty and recognize that the power and grace and love of Jesus is beyond anything we can encounter or experience in any other way. If we truly behold Jesus, we will always encounter his power. And at one point, Jesus' cousin, you might know him as John the Baptist, recognized this idea long before Palm Sunday even happened, before it was an idea. John the Baptist, you may know, is preaching in the wilderness and telling people to repent because the kingdom of God is near. Repent, repent, repent. This was John the Baptist's message. Nearly exclusively, this was John the Baptist's message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Until Jesus arrives on the scene. John stops his message and recognizes that in this moment, there is something else that's necessary for us to be doing. As Jesus approaches, everything changes. We see it put this way in John chapter 1, verse 29 in the English Standard Version. It says, The next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
So as John the Baptist is, is baptizing people and preaching, repent, 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 and to, to cleanse yourself of your sin. In this moment, as Jesus approaches, John stops. His preaching changes in this time. Because Jesus is here, Christ has come, and John the Baptist says the right thing to do in this moment is to stop and behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist says, before now you all have looked to me for spiritual direction and spiritual inspiration for guidance. And now it's time to turn your attention away from me. Look, it is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this word for look in the Greek as it was written is the word idu, and it's normally translated as look. That's why we use the English Standard Version today, because it uses the word behold rather than look. And I think in this moment, behold is an actually better word to be used in this instance. It's a better translation of what John the Baptist was trying to communicate when he says, look. It's not simply to look at something, but to behold it. It's the thing we can all recognize when somebody says, hey, look at that. It's pretty casual. Hey, look over there. Check that out. It's not very often in our language today. If someone says, behold, it's a little odd. If someone says, look, we look. But if someone says, behold, we would interpret that entirely differently than if they just said, hey, look, so-and-so's here. Look at that picture. Look across the street. Look what they're doing. I don't think that's what John the Baptist wants to say here. I think John the Baptist wants to say, behold, experience, encounter, recognize Jesus in all of his beauty, in all of his glory. He's here. And just like when we behold things as opposed to just look at them, we are changed when we behold. We experience, we encounter, we're transformed when we behold. When we look, we see. When we behold, we're changed. And I think it's normal for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to to look at Jesus or to look to Jesus. We look at Jesus for for guidance or for help. Well, what, what would Jesus do in my situation? We might look to Jesus for information. What did Jesus teach? What did Jesus say? We might look at, we might look to Jesus. And I think that these are good practices for our faith. We should look at Jesus. We should look to Jesus. We are, after all, Christians. We are Christians, followers of the way. It would make sense that we would look at Jesus, that we would look to Jesus for these things. But I think very often as followers of God today, especially 2,000 years after Christ's arrival, it is easy for us to look at Jesus, to look to Jesus. But it's not very often that we stop and actually behold Jesus the Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I think it's, it's an okay thing that in our, in our culture, in our understanding, that we might see Jesus as a friend. We sing about it. It's one of my favorite hymns, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I love it. It's a great one, and it recognizes that God loves you so much that he wants to be near. I remember growing up when I was in middle school, middle school, high school, they made these, like, T-shirts that had a picture of Jesus on them, and I think it was worn by Christians who were trying to make Jesus cool or relevant or whatever, and it said, Jesus is my homeboy. Uh, And I know that that stuck with me because I was like, that's a little strange. And I get what they're doing. They're trying to make, you know, Jesus isn't scary or intimidating or whatever. Jesus is my friend. 
And I'm not here to hate on the idea that Jesus is close like a friend or like a brother. That is absolutely true, unequivocally true. Jesus came near in human flesh that that might be true. That God might be one of us changes everything. But oftentimes we put so much emphasis on that that we don't really recognize who Jesus is, who our friend is. Do you recognize who your friend is? Jesus is your friend. Jesus might be your homeboy. But do you know who your homeboy is? Your homeboy is God. The creator of all of this, the sustainer of life. That's who Jesus is. Do we understand when we look at Jesus or when we look to Jesus, who we're looking at, who we're looking to, Because I think if we did, we wouldn't just look to Jesus or look at Jesus. We would also behold Jesus. Scripture uh, has a a word for this that's often misunderstood or misinterpreted. Um, And that word is fear. You may, you may understand the, or, or recognize the term that we should fear God, or, or especially in older translations, they use the word fear, but in our culture, in our context, it's misconstrued. But you may know that this word is fear in the Bible oftentimes, to fear God. That's not to be afraid, to cower, or to hide. To fear God in our scriptures, the better word that I would say in our modern-day context is to revere God. To revere God. What that means is really to understand who God is and to know who I am and to act accordingly. That yes, through the grace of God, Jesus gets to be my friend. That God gets to be my friend. What a wonderful story. What good news. But my friend is still the triune God of the universe. The creator of it all. The beginner and ender of life and of all things. The sustainer of all things. The one who who causes the sun to shine. Who knows the stars by name and who put them all in their place. This is who our friend is. This is what it means to fear God. In, uh, in, in many of you in Advent, over Advent, took a class with me on the line, the witch, in the wardrobe, and it was a lot of fun. And I shared in that class one of my favorite quotations from that book. In, in the book Aslan, the lion, you may be familiar, is the God character who comes in to save the land of Narnia. And and the people who are learning about Aslan for the first time are hearing about this good news that Aslan is coming, and he's going to come save Narnia. And they ask, well, he's a lion. That's scary. Is he safe? And the people who know Aslan say, no, he's not safe. He's not safe, but he's good. He's not safe, but he is good. And this is the God that we pray to, that we bow to, that we sing to, and that we worship. He's not safe. But he is good. I'm going to remind us of that picture of the, of the Poaz uh, volcano in Costa Rica. You remember seeing that picture? Seeing the picture is cool. Um, but it's quite the feeling to walk up a, 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 an active volcano and see smoke rising out of the top of it. And they gave us hard hats, uh, you know, just in case. I'm not sure how much that's going to do. It's, I mean, I, it's saving me from, you know, lava rock hitting my head, I guess, but I might be more worried about the lava chasing after me. Um, but in that moment, you step up to the crater. And maybe you've had an experience like this in your life, too, where you say, if something happens, 
That's it for me. It's all over. Now, of course, it's safe, and, and the scientists and people who are leading it know when it's time that we, they need to close her down and things of that nature. But you still know this is beautiful in one moment, but then the next, you say, holy cow, this is a volcano that can wipe out this entire region if the time struck. When we worship, when we pray, when we read Scripture, do we always encounter Jesus at, at the chair next to us, at the pew across from us? Do we always encounter Jesus in the way that we want to see Jesus that makes us feel good and happy and safe? Or do we ever pray? Do we ever sing? Do we ever worship? like we're at the crater of a volcano when we view God. To understand God's beauty, but at the same time to know God's power. To, to fear God, as it says in Scripture. To revere God. Do we ever pray like that? Do we ever sing like that? When is the last time we had a moment like that with God? Because God is so big that we can recognize God as a volcano. More powerful than we'll ever know. Bigger than we'll ever know. But God is so great that God is also small enough to be our brother and our friend. And these things can coexist simultaneously. And it's the best for us when we can live as Christians in this way. To be inspired by a friend who is close doesn't feel that amazing to know that God is close and God is my friend. But when you begin to think about the creator and sustainer of life, would care to know you by name, that cares for you intimately and deeply. This is where we begin to understand the transformation. That God is beautiful. But God is not safe. But God is beautiful. And God is good. And so on, on Palm Sunday, as we see this person of Jesus riding on the back of a donkey who's not what we expected him to be, Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And some people around are praising Jesus, shouting Hosanna, even though they don't really even know what they're shouting Hosanna for. They're placing their hope in whatever it is Jesus is going to do. But we also see people in our scripture kind of go up to these people who are laying their cloaks down and waving palm branches around, and they kind of nudge them. And they're like, what's the deal? Who is that? Who is that? And we may say, well, well, that's Jesus. But when, when we think about it and when we ask ourselves the question, who it is that we're shouting Hosanna to, who we're praising, and who we're praying to, if someone says, who is that? Our response in the way that we speak and in the way that we live and in the way that we act and in the way that we pray and in the way that we worship, our response ought to be, when someone asks us, who is that? Should be, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's here. He's come because that God is that big and yet cares so closely. And so what I want to do as, as we close is, is to practice this to practice our understanding of God's overwhelming power and might and, and bigness. Because that's what changes us. Jesus as a friend changes us in one kind of way, but understanding how powerful our God is changes us like never before. I'm going to practice 
envisioning us approaching the throne of God as if we're walking up an active volcano that can erupt at any minute and we know it, but it's beautiful. It's not safe, but it's good. And so I want to take a moment for us to pray. And Tenson, if, if, you'll, if you'll play um, whatever's on your heart, just give us a time to, to pray together. To pray on our own. The altar is open, if that's useful for you. To drop on your knees before God's glory and power and might. Because as we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem, we might look at him. We might look to him. But let's take this opportunity and take this moment to be whole. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's approach the throne together. Thank you.